Welcome back. This should be a really short and to the point video. In this video, we're going to look at the degradation pathway for cysteine. And as we'll find, the degradation of cysteine to pyruvate occurs in two enzymatic steps. Cysteine levels in the blood are fairly tightly controlled. One thing we must understand about cysteine is you don't want a lot of it in the blood. If you have an excess of cysteine in the blood, it can cause cysteine toxicity and that's not good. So in other words, we have to control the cysteine levels somehow. One of the ways we control cysteine levels in the blood is by catabolizing it down to pyruvate. And the rate limiting and committed step in this catabolic pathway is catalyzed by cysteine dioxygenase. Okay, So this enzyme effectively removes cysteine from the blood and the cell. And it's going to irreversibly dioxygenate the sulfur atom right here on cysteine. So both atoms of molecular oxygen are going to get incorporated into the cysteine molecule on the sulfur atom. And what that generates is this molecule right here, which is called sulfenoalanine. And the reason it's called sulfenoalanine is because it has this sulfeno group. And if you were to look at the rest of the molecule, well, hey, that's just alanine, right? Or you could call it an alanyl group, right? So that's the name sulfenoalanine. Now, sulfenoalanine really stands at a crossroad in liver cell metabolism. Um, the sulfenoalanine can go one of two directions. Either it can go and be degraded to pyruvate, through the next enzyme, or it can go into something called taurine biosynthesis. And we won't go into a whole lot of detail here about taurine, but effectively what it is, is it's a molecule that can be ligated to certain bile acids to make them more hydrophilic, and it's used in digestion of fats in the duodenum. Okay, so taurine would be used there. So that's one direction it can go, but the direction we're going to, we're going to consider here is the direction of cysteine catabolism. Okay, now what happens if cysteine is present in large amounts? Well, like we said, you don't want a whole lot of it in the blood because it can cause acute cysteine toxicity. So the cell reacts by making more of this enzyme, cysteine dioxygenase. But what happens when cysteine levels fall in the blood? Well, those levels are sensed, and what ends up happening is to prevent uh, dangerously low levels of cysteine through catabolism, this enzyme cysteine dioxygenase is ubiquitinated. And when you ubiquitinate a protein, what that means is you're transferring molecules of ubiquitin, which are other proteins, onto the protein itself. And when a proteasome, which is a molecular garbage can, when it recognizes a protein that has ubiquitin on it, it proteolyzes that protein. In other words, if you have protein A that has ubiquitin on it, the proteasome will recognize the ubiquitin molecule and it will proteolyze protein A. So in order to prevent extremely low levels of cysteine, um, ubiquitin is attached to cysteine dioxygenase and the enzyme would be degraded to prevent further catabolism. This allows cysteine levels to be fairly constant in the blood and to prevent um, unsafe levels either on the high or low end. But anyways, we get sulfenoalanine through this enzyme. Now we're going to run in the direction of cysteine catabolism and sulfenoalanine will react with sulfenoalanine transaminase. And just like all transaminases, this is a pyridoxal phosphate dependent reaction, right? And mechanistically it's not this way, but uh, from for a, taking a test point of view when you're trying to remember structures, you can effectively think of these reactions as substitutions between amines and carbonyls. So this is the alpha amine of cysteine, so in the or alpha amine of sulfenoalanine, excuse me, we should expect to see an alpha keto group in the next molecule when we do. So what we're doing is we're taking a molecule of alpha ketoglutarate and basically taking the amine from sulfenoalanine and placing it on the alpha carbon of alpha ketoglutarate. That's going to give us L-glutamate, right, and sulfenopyrin. Pyruvate. Now, sulfenopyruvate is going to undergo a spontaneous hydrolysis, meaning that it has a negative delta G and it occurs non-enzymatically. And so the bond that's going to be cleaved is this one right here. And in the process, we generate sulfite and pyruvate. Now, if you are a liver cell, the pyruvate that you generate is going to go into gluconeogenesis to form glucose. And that glucose will be released by the hepatocytes into the blood to feed peripheral tissues. But you also don't want a lot of sulfite. So sulfite will react with an enzyme called sulfite oxidase. 
and sulfite oxidase catalyzes the incorporation of one atom of oxygen into sulfite to make sulfate. So this molecule right here, this is sulfate. Okay, and as we know um, from biosynthesis, the sulfate can be incorporated into uh, three prime phosphoadenylate to make PAPS, and PAPS can be used for sulfate transfers in certain enzymatic reactions. So let's do a quick recap of this reaction scheme. Cysteine reacts with the rate limiting and committed step in its catabolism, which is cysteine dioxygenase, which incorporates both atoms of molecular oxygen into the sulfur atom of cysteine, generating sulfenoalanine. Remember that this enzyme is regulated by ubiquitination. In other words, if cysteine levels rise, this enzyme is non-ubiquitinated. But if cysteine levels fall, in order to prevent extremely low levels of cysteine in the blood, cysteine dioxygenase is ubiquitinated and a proteasome proteolyzes the enzyme. This gives us sulfenoalanine, which gets transaminated by sulfenoalanine transaminase to give us sulfenopyruvate. Now, one thing I did not mention earlier, and I do want to be sure to mention this, is that sulfenoalanine transaminase is the same enzyme as aspartate transaminase. And what I want to do is this. I want to ask you a question. Look at the structure of sulfenoalanine. And my question to you is, what's an amino acid that looks very similar to that that's one of our primary 20? Well, if you look at the structure of this, okay, we still have our alpha carboxyl group, we have our alpha amine, we have our alpha carbon that's right here in my mouse's, then we have our beta carbon, and then what if I have this, right? What if I have this? Well, structurally, this well, this is aspartate, right? And structurally, aspartate looks very similar to sulfenoalanine. Now, of course. Um, this carbon atom right here, of course, this carbon atom is a lot smaller than this sulfur atom, right? But they do look very similar, okay? Um, if you were to look at the rest of the molecule, right, it's just alanine, right? Just like it's alanine here, right, this group right here, this is just an alanyl group. And so then you just have this negative charge that's attached to that alanyl group. In the case of sulfenoalanine, it's a sulfenyl group. In the case of aspartate, it's a carboxyl group. So structurally, they're very similar to each other. And that's why sulfenoalanine transaminase is the same enzyme as aspartate transaminase. They're one and the same. In other words, another way of saying this is that sulfenoalanine reacts with aspartate transaminase. Okay, And remember that aspartate transaminase is both a mitochondrial and a cytosolic enzyme. Keep that in mind. Okay, So sulfenoalanine reacts with aspartate transaminase and you get sulfenopyruvate. Sulfenopyruvate undergoes a spontaneous hydrolysis and that bond that's, or that, that line that's in purple represents the bond that's being cleaved and we get pyruvate and sulfite. Pyruvate goes into gluconeogenesis assuming that you're a liver hepatocyte and the glucose gets dumped into the blood and feeds uh, peripheral tissues. The sulfite gets oxidized by sulfite oxidase to form sulfite sulfate which is a less toxic version of a sulfur oxygen containing compound. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on cysteine catabolism. See you in the next video.